and not for what I was born. And I hope they saw in me the qualities of fairness and impartiality that are looked for in all speakers. One of my early predecessors said that the speaker should be, and I quote, big and comely, stately and well-spoken, his voice great, his carriage majestic, his nature haughty, and his purse plentiful. I do not live up to the latter requirement, and I leave it to others to judge whether I live up to any of the other descriptions. I wouldn't tell you that I always have a very easy time. Uh, what I can say is that on the whole I've got an enjoyable time. I don't think anybody should be ashamed to say that she or he enjoys his job. For my part, I don't want to do anything else. I can also say that I have a much better time than a lot of my predecessors. After all, nine of my predecessors lost their lives at the behest of the king, mostly by beheading for getting on bad terms with the monarch. I, can, I think I can say with absolute confidence that today I have a better relationship with Buckingham Palace than they had. Uh, but Sir John Wenlock, who was speaker in 1456, had a particularly unfortunate end at the Battle of Tewkesbury between the Lancastrians and the Yorkists. Speaker Wenlock, uh, in addition to his parliamentary duties, was a soldier. And he arrived late with the Lancastrian reinforcements. This irritated his colleagues and the description of the battle says he was struck down and his skull cleft in two with a battle axe by the Duke of Somerset for not coming in time, whereby the fortunes of the day were lost. Well, I think this was very drastic punishment for being late. And I'm sure my colleagues in the Commons would be more understanding these days. But I do ensure that I take the chair in my house very promptly at 2.30 every day and not a minute later. Of course, there have been good speakers and there's bad speakers. There have also been arrogant speakers. The most famous of the arrogant ones, I think, was Speaker Seymour in the reign of Charles II. When the speakers coach broke down at Charing Cross, he ordered his attendants to stop the next coach to pass and commandeer it. And when the occupant objected, Seymour said, Sir, it is far more proper for you to walk in the streets than the Speaker of the House of Commons. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, when I've been caught in a storm without a taxi, I've never been tempted to use such tactics. I don't think they would, I would be able to pull it off in this day and age. Uh, then we had Speaker Trevor in the reign of James II. He had a rather a handicap for anybody in the chair. He had a problem with his eyes. He had a very, very bad squint. And when he bowed to call a member as they did in those days, one would get up on either side of the chamber. And it was to end this confusion that the practice was started uh, by the chair of calling a member by name. And today, I am the only person in the House who refers to a member by name. But I have to tell you, I had a great problem uh, in April, after April 1992, when, after our election, when we had an intake of new members. It was very difficult for me in a few days to recognize all the names. Of course, with the women members, it was very easy. Women are very colorful personalities, with a great deal of panache. That was terribly easy, but for the men in grey suits, it was awfully difficult, and they used to rise, as you know, in my house. They rise to be called to speak. They have to catch my eye. Occasionally, I would say, the honorable gentleman there in the red tie or the blue tie or whatever it was, and I got tired of that, and I would say, oh, the, the, no, 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 that, the very handsome one there on the third row back. It caused total, total chaos. I had to improve on my memory from then onwards. But as I said, they've been good and bad speakers. They've also been great speakers. One of these was Speaker Onslow. He was elected to the chair at the young age of 36. 
and he continued for the next 33 years. Speaker Onslow saw the development of cabinet government, the rise of newspaper reporting and the practice of government and opposition supporters sitting on opposite sides of the chamber. You know they do in the Commons. Uh, this, of course, leads to the confrontational and adversarial nature of proceedings which continue today in my house. But what made Onslow a great speaker? was the way he laid the foundations of the office as we know it today. He ended the idea that the Speaker was an automatic government supporter. He made impartiality the rule for the chair, and he stopped Speakers having the post merely as a sideline to other money-making activities. Some members of Parliament, they criticised him for being a stickler for good manners, and obsessed with procedure. But so much of what he achieved still holds good in the Commons more than 200 years later. But I can tell you that my favourite speaker, and I can have a favourite because they're all that I'm speaking of so much in the past, my favourite speaker is Peel, the son of Sir Robert Peel, the man who introduced the modern idea of policing. Speaker Peel, although he suffered a great deal from varicose veins, he never missed a thing as he sat in the house hour after hour after hour. He was, as one Irish member pointed out in a very typical Irish phrase, always on the pounce. It was said that the mere rustling of his robe was sufficient to quell the noise in the chamber. Well, I have to tell my colleagues here, I've tried rustling my black robe, but it does not quite the, have the same effect. They don't seem to make silk of that sort of quality these days. And Peel had to deal with quite a lot, you know. There was physical brawling in the chamber during his speakership, particularly on the issue of Irish home rule. And when he retired, Lord Rosebery, who was Prime Minister at the time, was most unkind to him after a most distinguished career in the chair. Old Queen Victoria was, had been very impressed with Peel, and she was terribly worried about finding a suitable successor. And Lord Rosebery heard of this, and he wrote to the old Queen Victoria to reassure her. And he wrote this direct quote, There is much exaggeration about the attainment requisite for a speaker. All speakers are highly successful, all are deeply respected, all are assumed to be irreplaceable, but a new speaker is soon found, almost invariably, among the mediocrities of the House. I think if any, speak, if, you know, if any speaker ever becomes self-important, Lord Rosebery's words should be remembered, and I certainly keep them to the forefront of my mind. Our MPs get pretty excited, just as they do here, and just as they did in Speaker Peel's days. And I'm often asked if I find the proceedings rowdy. I, I disparage the use of that word. They're not rowdy. I always say, perhaps they're a little robust. I certainly think our MPs work hard. We have a fairly long summer recess, which is sometimes criticised, but it has to be remembered that a recess isn't necessary a holiday. The government goes on governing, which means ministers have to be at their desk for much of the recess. So do their shadow counterparts from the opposition. Uh, recess or not, there's always the continuing demand from newspapers and from television for news and for views. So they always have to be on time. Speakers also use the recess to carry out official visits overseas such as this. And I'm very delighted to have the opportunity of seeing a little more of India. While all of us, of course, who are elected representatives, the constituency work goes on, with the everyday concerns of the voters continuing to flood either into our office or into our home. And my house sits for long hours. During the last parliamentary session, the Commons sat for 1,983 hours and 48 minutes, over a total of 240 sitting days. Now, I'm going to work that out for you, because it means 
an average of eight hours, 16 minutes a day on the floor of the house, quite apart from committee work. So I think, and I say here as I say at home, the British taxpayer gets value for the money paid to our parliamentarians. I think one of the strengths of the democracy is its possible diversity and its adaptability to different circumstances. I think one instance of flexibility came about with my election. It, has, of course, has long been the custom to choose a speaker from government benches. But in my case, tradition was defied and I became the first opposition member of parliament to be elected as speaker since the year 1835. So Westminster was perfectly willing to try something different. This same adaptability has often been shown among those countries that have adopted the Westminster parliamentary system. And the Office of Speaker, I think, is an example of this. My position has many similarities to that of Speaker Patel. We discussed them at uh, Commonwealth Speakers Conferences and again yesterday. There are also, of course, significant differences. Speakers at Westminster, like those in your parliament, often see history being made. In some cases, great events occur in front of them. In other cases, the repercussions of faraway crises dominate the proceedings of our legislature. Ladies and gentlemen, since I became actively involved in politics, which means the period from the ending of the Second World War and today, I think there have been three <coughs> great occasions of enormous drama and potential for good which have impressed me most. They are, and not necessarily, in order of precedence. The independence of India, the ending of apartheid in South Africa, the collapse of communism and the democratization of Eastern Europe, which was symbolized by the tearing down of the Berlin Wall. In addition to these three historic events, there has been another one, which played a large and tragic part in the affairs of my country. And I refer, of course, to the problem of Northern Ireland, which has produced such awful happenings in the province itself as it has on the mainland. And I cannot speak today without mentioning Ulster. But though this has been a dominant theme in Britain for a quarter of a century, it hasn't been a world event in the way that the other three have been world events. And in any case, the peace process which we all pray will be successful, is still going on. So let me turn to the three great and hopeful events on the international scene, which I have mentioned. Let me take Eastern Europe first. There are many of you here today who, like me, grew up under the shadow of annihilation. The Cold War meant that the terrors of the Second World War were succeeded almost immediately by the even greater terrors made possible by nuclear weapons. Mr. Chairman, my first memories are of the 1930s. Even as a very small child, it was possible to, to, it was possible to gather from the attitudes of grown-ups that something rather unpleasant could be on the way. And it was. I spent part of my school days in an air raid shelter. And although no bombs fell on my family, they fell all around us in the West Riding of Yorkshire. Now, of course, the threat of war has, it's not gone forever. You in India know that better than most. Terrible things can still happen, indeed are happening at this very moment in various parts of the globe. But even admitting that, it is still evident that the possibility of an all-out war spreading throughout the world is now less than at any point during my lifetime. And for that, we give thanks. 
Within the last few weeks, an event of great symbolic significance has taken place. And that is the final withdrawal of Russian troops from the countries of Eastern Europe. Those countries, like the Russians, will rejoice in their newfound freedom. The freedom to establish democracy. The freedom to develop market economies. And the freedom to forge their own place in the world. But it is the desire for democracy still fragile, still tentative, which is the outstanding feature. It has been one of my pleasures and one of my great privileges of my speakership to welcome visitors from the former communist countries to Westminster. They want to know 